What is up, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Assemble Performance Podcast. I'm your host, Justin Jones. Whether I'm hitting the trails, training for an ultra marathon, or pushing my limits in the gym strength training, I've always been fascinated by what drives us to perform at our best. This podcast is for everyone from the serious endurance, strength, or hybrid athlete to the outdoor enthusiast who wants to live life to the fullest. I believe that peak performance is an assembly of physical training, mental fortitude, emotional health, and social support. Whether you're training for a sport or viewing life itself as the ultimate athletic event, join me in redefining limits and living a life full of challenges and adventure. Let's get into today's podcast. What's up, guys? We've got another episode of the podcast today. Today, we have Dr. Carl Bascobi. He is an injury psychologist, and he currently works with injured athletes and performers in their rehab, and he also trains healthcare professionals. So, Carl, how's it going? Yeah, hi, Justin. Nice to meet you, and yeah, great to be along and have a, have a conversation today. So uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm excited to talk. So starting out, a lot of people might see their injury rehab and health even as purely a physical thing. So could you maybe give an introduction to the listeners as to where a psychologist fits into all of this? Yeah, absolutely. And my, my journey into it also started as very much focused on the physical side. I was an athlete. I played rugby growing up and for a long time suffered from a lot of injuries and I treated it from a physical point of view, but didn't really understand the kind of complexity to it from a kind of bio psycho social perspective so that sparked my curiosity and i wanted to really dive in and understand a little bit more about the mental side of it the emotional side because it was tough it was hard when i was sidelined when i was injured it wasn't just the physical components to the injury it was the the identity challenges it was the emotional challenges it was the spiral of emotions that i would go through individually so I started diving in and understanding it a little bit more it took me on this journey to becoming a psychologist and now I feel where psychology fits is is really part of that team part of the M MDT if you call it that you know that multidisciplinary approach to supporting rehabilitation and I think if we're all sat around the table having conversation about what care looks like when it comes to rehabilitation I think we can all add from our perspectives, some really good insights that helps that kind of 360 approach to recovery. I love that. Could you maybe explain what the biopsychosocial model is? Because not a lot of people that aren't coaches or healthcare professionals have probably heard that before. Yeah, absolutely. So when I talk about the biopsychosocial model, it's really the interplay between the biology, the psychology and, and the social aspects. And it's really the interplay of all of those together in knowing that, you know, your biology, your physical health, your genetic vulnerabilities, they contribute to your overall health and the psychological components being your coping skills, your social skills, relationships, previous traumas and, and ways of coping with history of stresses that also adds to it as do the social components. So it's really a, a, a way of understanding health, injury, illness, and a way to kind of systematically consider a holistic approach that kind of adds these systems together. So we think of these three spheres coming together and the sweet spot being, being the middle. We're talking about the biological, the psychological and the social in that way. It's really a lot of my underpinning and understanding and knowledge base came from really that, that basis or that, that approach. So I think a lot of people relate things to their own lives. And so if somebody hasn't heard of this before, they might be thinking back now to some of their athletic background or their training now and think, okay, can I think of an example of this in my own training? So could you maybe give an example for the everyday person that's maybe wasn't aware that, you know, their psychology and sociology really impacted their, you know, biology from a health or training standpoint and kind of explain like everyday examples of this. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess I'll give you uh, one example of how we might become injured or ill. And one of the biggest contributors to, to an injury is 
stress. And if we think of stress from a psychological perspective, the way in which we respond to that is based largely on our ability to cope or our our perception that we can cope with that stressor. Now that's a psychological element called the coping skills or our coping skills. That's really our ability to cope with that, that stressor. And every stress is a perception. It's our perception of, of what we can or can't cope with. Now, the biggest buffer of uh, stress is social support. So then we've got that social side. So your family circumstances, your peers, your colleagues, people around you, your partner, they can contribute to and buffer the perception of stress. So social support can buffer the negative effects of stress. If we can reduce the stress, we're likely to maybe not impact our physical health or increase our susceptibility of injury. So there we can see an example of how that psychological component, your coping skills and your social component, your, your peers and people around you can really contribute to whether you're susceptible to an injury based on the stress that you experience or illness based on how stress can affect the physical health. Does that help give a bit of a flavor as to how those things can intertwine and, and connect there? It does. Yeah. I think that it's getting better with society, but I think that there is still a problem, especially with men, maybe with everybody, especially with men, with connecting emotionally with themselves and feeling emotion. And for a lot of people, the weight room or running can be a form of unplugging and people might see their runs or their weight sessions as like, this is where I go to not feel all these negative things that maybe they don't even know that they're feeling. And so to them, training feels unemotional even. So could you maybe speak to that side of things? Yeah. uh, So what we find a lot of the time is that as as human beings, we use distraction as one of the biggest uh, ways of coping with any challenges or stresses that we face. Now we know exercise and sport and activity is, is useful from a physiological point of view in terms of managing stress, but also increasing those endorphins that help us feel better and increase our mood and they're they're facts that we can all see and we can understand that but you're absolutely right we sometimes use it as a way of escapism of distraction and we call it distraction coping it's still a coping uh, strategy or skill but it's one that's typically associated with avoidance avoidance of those emotions that discomfort Um, and there is a lot of stigma around it especially in men around sitting and talking about emotions and feelings and thoughts and society, as you say, is getting better. We are moving towards being able to open up and talk about these areas that are just human. We're all human beings. We all have thoughts, feelings, emotions, and we can come together and discuss it like we are today in this, in this format, we can hopefully open up to many, many others that, that, that message that it's okay that it's okay to talk about it, that it's not a sign of weakness, it's a sign of strength and vulnerability is strength. So if we can see it that way, we can, we can add other coping skills to that one that we're using. Now, sport, exercise, activity, those distraction coping techniques are great. And I'm not here to change anyone's mind on the use of those. I think they're, they're perfect. They fit exactly what they're meant to do, but it's just about advancing maybe those other coping skills. Um, and adding to that toolbox of coping that might just give us a few more things to, to work with when we're faced with those challenges or those really uncomfortable emotions. Definitely. I would love to pick back up on this, but now that we've kind of set a case for the biopsychosocial factors, maybe for the people that weren't aware of it before, I would love to hear more about your background and you mentioned, you know, multiple injuries and getting interested in this. So could you maybe give us a little bit more information on that? Yeah, sure. So my background started, yeah, like I say, when I was, when I was an athlete, I was playing rugby and I was faced a lot, a lot of injuries and these injuries came up during transitions in my life, whether I was uh, starting a university degree or, uh, starting a new job. It was normally around this time that I would find myself getting injured and I really didn't understand why, because I was in good physical shape. I felt that everything was going well, but, but something just wasn't connecting. And for me, it was really the management of stress and dealing with stresses that created that kind of 
curiosity in the link between psychology and injury. And it's, it's profound and it's complex. And I spent the last 15 years working and researching and occupying that space where, where I'm now situated. So as an injury psychologist, I really work at the intersection of injury, health, well-being and performance. And I work with a lot of injured athletes and performers on a kind of one-to-one -one basis, but I'm also finding a lot of work in education, education of therapists, mental health care professionals, other healthcare professionals as well, and clinicians around some of that psychological side of injury, illness, rehabilitation. Now, part of my journey is my training is in sports psychology. So I have a background in as a sports psychologist and, and training in sports psychologists. And my research background, my PhD was working in the kind of chronic illness space. I worked with a lot of transplant recipients and focused on the self-management of chronic illness and rehabilitation. So I decided to put the two and two together and become a practitioner that focus specifically on injury re and rehabilitation. And yeah, for the past 10 years, that's where I've been kind of situated. So you mentioned in your own um, background, a lot of the injuries came up around big life transitions or big stress points. Do you find that that's very common among most people? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. I think transitions uh, are a huge stressor and stress being the greatest psychological predictor of injury frequency, but also kind of the duration of, of injury. So yeah, I think there is a, there's definitely a link and psychological stress really comes from this imbalance between the demands that we're faced and the coping ability or this idea that we can cope with what we're dealing with. So from my own personal experience, there must have been a demand there that I felt I couldn't cope with. And that for me may have led to the injury. Now we can't be certain of that because there's many other factors at play as there are for many, many athletes as to what causes injury. But what I do find is that, um, those that suffer severe injuries, there tends to be some other things, other factors going on in their life around that time that may have caused or, or contributed to that risk. So yeah, there is definitely when the demands are high, all those stresses are high, the demand on the individual to, to cope with that kind of shoots up exponentially and whether they have the coping skills to manage that or not is going to largely determine their risk of, of injury from that point of view. And there's a lot of research and evidence to really support that stress injury relationship. So yeah, I do think there's a, there's a correlation from the athletes that I work with that, that supports that. Yeah. With a lot of the athletes I work with, they sometimes at the beginning are unsure why I'm asking about the rest of their life. It, you know, they're like, why are you asking me about how I feel about work today? Because they don't see it as relevant. Do you, you know, I have to explain to them that like your body is maybe more stressed from a stressful period of life, like you said, and your recovery ability is lower than it maybe would normally be if you say didn't have a job or had a very easy job or something. My question for you around these life transitions is, do you see increased injury rates from this because the, the overall body is more stressed, so there's less recovery demand? Or, and maybe it's, it's both in some instances, is there increased training load in an attempt to kind of emotionally cope with the increased stress and then that causes injury? Yeah, really, really. There is a strong link there. So I guess from the phys physiological point of view, we know that there's changes that happen when we're, when we're under stress uh, and there's attentional changes as well, where almost kind of get those blinkers come up and we're not able to really attend to those cues in the environment that maybe we would beforehand. So it increases our, our risk because we're not able to attune to certain situations that might be a risk to injury, but it's also to do with our history of stresses. So these big life situations that we're under, have we been through them before? Have we faced similar challenges? And if we have, then we're likely to have built some coping skills to manage those emotional demands. So 
and you're right that there is a physical load, but there's an emotional load, a mental load, which if we're faced with for the first time can be incredibly overwhelming, but it's really our, our appraisal of the situation, how we think about that transition, how we think about that, the stressor that creates some of those changes, which can then increase our risk. So we also know that the personality type of person you are can also increase or moderate your stress response. So how you, how you respond to that stress and how you appraise it. So there's many, many factors at play here, but I would say that if you've been faced and what I've seen in, in my work before is this, if individuals have potentially faced similar stressful situations or been under the similar demands before, they're likely to have the coping resources or skills to, to minimize their stress response. And if they can reduce that stress response, they're likely to not kind of experience the effects of that in terms of the risk of injury. That leads into my next question, which was, uh, this ability to deal with stress is, um, it a skill that can be built, which it sounds like it definitely is. Absolutely. Right. So there are many, many stress reduction techniques from relaxation techniques to meditation, to deep breathing and mindfulness. And I think those skills are integral, are really important in, in the world that we live in. You know, we're, we're human beings and we're not quite equipped to manage and navigate the fast pace of, of the world as it is today. So finding moments to slow down and just breathe can, can offer some relief and reduction in that stress and that load as certainly that cognitive load that we're under. But as I mentioned before, the social support is probably the biggest buffer of stress. So if we have that support system, that network around us, we're likely to feel that we can manage and navigate that stressor or those stresses that we're dealing with. So I really do feel that those two things, having some stress reduction techniques in your toolbox, whether that's breathing, relaxation, mindfulness, but also really, you know, emphasizing your social support network and having a strong support network is likely to reduce that stress or at least buffer it. And it can also enhance our overall well-being and our ability to cope. So I would definitely focus on those two areas to navigate stresses that we're dealing with and faced in our lives. So on the social support aspect, you know, post COVID, a lot of people work from home and also just, I feel like, especially in America, there's a kind of shift in the culture and a less reliance on work for those relationships and more reliance on outside relationships. But it can be really hard for people to build those relationships, especially men, you know, you see online a lot, you hear a lot about like loneliness epidemic. So do you see that's a big issue with the people you work with and how do you approach that? I think it's one of the biggest issues that we're faced with in, in the world that we live in now is this idea that we are networked individuals, but we're not, we're not social anymore in the way that we used to be. And technology has a, a large part to, to play in that, in the way that we can connect as we're doing today online and our ability to do that has reduced our need or the thought that we need that ability to connect in, in person. And so it's one of the biggest challenges that I think society is facing is, is exactly what you said, that loneliness kind of pandemic or challenges that faced that have come out of COVID and people are still navigating them in, in their own ways. But what I find is that since, since COVID, the social anxiety for a lot of individuals has increased exponentially. And that has led to the resistance to want to integrate back into those networks of support or those social settings, because it produces and brings up a lot of discomfort and men not to stigmatize us, but we are notoriously bad at networking and, and being social. So I would really challenge us to keep those conversations going. And as we are today, raise that awareness of the fact that loneliness and the lack of social support can, can bring up a lot of risks, uh, especially when dealing with stress or injury or illness. And we've got to just find ways to connect in, in however we can in the new ways that we're, we're finding life to be, but 
yeah, I definitely feel we need to find ways to do it. I don't know what the answers are because a lot of my work is online as well. And, uh, you know, as a psychologist, I find it challenging to, to not have that connectedness in, in person as we, as we used to before, but it's, it's certainly the way in which the world has gone and we've got to just try and find new ways of emotionally connecting if we can't be there physically. So for, for everybody, but I feel like I've heard this talked about before for men connecting through a hobby is probably the best way to do things. I see, you know, there's like run clubs, you can go to the gym, stuff like that. But a lot of these, you know, you go to a lot of these places and it seems like everybody's already in their own little group. And so you might show up a few times, kind of feel like, okay, I don't fit in and not go back. I don't know how much like group psychology you've, you know, researched, but that's always a fascinating thing for me. And I've been researching that a lot lately. So what are your thoughts on that aspect of it? Yeah, I, any way that you can find connectedness and we're likely to feel more connected to those that are similar to us. It's, it's the way that we, we operate. So finding an activity or a hobby, an interest that brings you together, um, will offer often that opportunity to, to connect, uh, emotionally, physically, and for men, especially finding, a an activity to engage in softens that, um, idea around connecting with others and uh, it gives you a focus point away from yourself that may, might make it easier to engage like going to the gym i know there's many different apps and things that help you find gym buddies and uh, give you an certainly from the uk anyway i'm sure it's i'm sure it's further than that but finding people to connect with through the activities that you're doing but it's tough i acknowledge that it is really tough in the world that we live in the ways in which we work now it's incredibly hard to have those off chance encounters where we're going to meet and make friends or, or connect with people that we can, we can continue building into our network. So I would, I would just challenge people to find an activity that they really enjoy and engage in it fully, but for the purposes of not just the activity, but the social side. Absolutely. So bringing it back a little bit to stress and injury. I have athletes, some athletes that work multiple jobs or, you know, I have multiple kids and so they're very busy and I'm going to say this as a coach, but also as a person who deals with this, because I think everybody does, it can be very hard to have compassion with yourself. And especially when you're in a very stressful period of life and you feel like you're not hitting all your training or you get injured, that just adds on and people just, you know, beat themselves up. So could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, gosh, that's such a a big area that I, I find is that when, when we're injured, we, we then kind of that critical voice comes out even stronger and harder. And it's hard to be kind to ourselves because we often associate that as, as weakness or taking our foot off the gas, but it's just trying to change our relationship with compassion and know that that self-love, that kindness is not weakness. It's, it's absolute strength if we can use it in the right way. And if we can extend that compassion to ourselves, we're more likely to be able to offer it outwards to others as well. And it's th that kind of old mantra or saying, which is, you know, if you, when you go on a plane, you go on holiday and they go through the safety briefing, they always inform you to put your own oxygen mask on bef in, before that of someone else in, in case of emergency when we're faced with emergencies in our day-to-day -day life, whether that's injury, whether that's stress, whether that's busy lives, we've got to really do that. We've got to put that oxygen mask on and that oxygen mask is that compassion, is that kindness. It's the way in which we treat and talk to ourselves. But sometimes it's on a very subconscious level. So we don't know that we're being hard on ourselves until we really notice how we talk to ourselves. And so what I encourage others to do is really tune into that inner dialogue, that inner voice of how you talk to yourself. And I just encourage them to ask themselves whether they would talk to anyone else like that. And often we find that no one will, right? Because if they did, they probably wouldn't have many people around them because that voice is critical. It's, there's, it's rigid. There's no kindness to it. So once we become aware of that, we can then change it. We can change it to that kindness, that compassion, 
And self-compassion has got so many added benefits to reducing stress, increasing well-being, overall, overall mental health. So yeah, I think it's a challenge, but we can, we can challenge it by just talking about it and, um, being conscious of the ways we talk to ourselves. Do you find just bringing awareness to a lot of those subconscious things helps a lot of people? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's uh, awareness is one of the first kind of go to things before we can add anything on to, to support someone. It's just having that awareness of themselves and that can go a hell of a long way if they understand their thoughts, their feelings, their emotions, the way they talk to themselves, the, the beliefs that they hold about the world, about themselves. If we can start to understand that from our own point of view, we can make sense of others around us, our friends, our family, and we can then change things if we feel that they're not in a place that are helpful or useful to us. So that awareness is the biggest tool if individuals can become aware. And that, that awareness only comes from having that introspection, having that ability to stop and pause and and look inwards for a little bit, but it's uncomfortable as well because, and what I find in a lot of clients that I speak with, that discomfort comes before the solutions to support their existing or kind of initial problems, because it turns, they turn inwards and they find out things about themselves that they hadn't thought or, or found out for a very long time. And it can be very uncomfortable, but in that discomfort, there's opportunities to grow and develop and learn. So yeah, that awareness of self is paramount. So, so important. When we say turn inwards, you know, people say that uh, a good amount and it's awesome, but you know, some people might, and I used to as well think, okay, what does that even mean? Like, how do I do that? Because you say turn inwards and it's like, okay, I get that, but I don't know how to do that. So how, you know, somebody like an athlete that may have been using exercise as a coping mechanism, which we can get into, and maybe they keep themselves very busy. They're not used to feeling uh, the things they're used to pushing it off and doing something else. They might not even know where to start with this. So what tools do you give people when they're trying to start out with this? Yeah, it's, it's a really great question. And I think for, first and foremost, it's just giving people the ability and the space to just pause and stop and then kind of transcend to thinking about what's going on for them, you know, in a firstly in a physical sense, because we understand that probably the most easiest, you know, what, how am I feeling today? What's, what's going on in my body right now as I, as I sit here and, and speak and where do I feel that? Where do I feel those feelings? What, and how's that influencing my thoughts? How is that influencing what I think about the world, about today, about myself? And do those thoughts, how do they interact with my behavior? Do they, do they influence, are they influencing anything that I'm doing today? If we can just stop and ground ourselves or kind of what I say is drop the anchor, then we can start to really touch base with that experience, that inner experience. And that's really our thoughts, feelings, emotions, our memories, and how they're showing up for us in, in that specific moment. So yeah, I would encourage, and the work that I do enables individuals to, I guess, stop and pause and think about those things because I'm asking them those questions, but if they were on their own and if listeners out there were thinking about how do we turn that inwards, I would say. Think about dropping the anchor. Think about just grounding yourself right now where you are. Keep your feet to the ground and just start to think about what's going on for you. Start to touch base with that feeling, those sensations, where they show up for you. And in doing that, we're almost kind of practicing that mindfulness or that mindful approach to just touching base with ourselves. And we don't do it very often because it's uncomfortable and there's a lot of things that it might bring up for us. And we're also great at using distraction techniques to, to kind of 
avoid any of that stuff. So it's really just to get real honest with ourselves and experience those feelings or those emotions and to normalize them, to know that it's okay. You know, negative emotions is not a, it's not a bad thing. It might be uncomfortable, but it's only our judgment of them that creates a lot of the discomfort. The emotions themselves, we can manage, we can, we can deal with. So I would encourage us just to feel them, um, touch base with them, acknowledge them and not judge them, but just accept them for part of that human experience. So I want to take a second for people that may have been like, Hey, I I'm listening to this. I want to increase my athletic performance. I haven't really talked about that. Like, you know, what's going on? You know, I've talked to a sports psychologist before. I know a lot of people that have, and what surprised me is that when you go to talk to a sports psychologist about sport, most of the first sessions don't even touch on the sport because all of this matters when it comes to sports performance, especially as you get into the higher level athletes. And the way I think of it is you can't really understand how you relate to your sport if you don't really understand how you re relate to yourself or it's hard to. And so I just wanted to take a minute and explain that this all does actually impact your performance. If that's what you're here for or your health, you know, fill in the blank. Uh, absolutely. And I guess that where I, I situate a lot of my work is through a, acceptance and commitment therapy, kind of a, a third wave behavioral therapy approach. And it's centered around this idea of psychological flexibility. And that can be anything from improving our daily functioning to do with illness or injury or, or performance. And psychological flexibility is really around three things. That's being present, uh, doing what matters and opening up. And we spoke about some of those components already, but opening up is really allowing that inner experience of our emotions, our feelings and accepting them. Being present is just allowing ourselves to situate where we are right now. The future focused orientation is where anxiety kind of manifests and the past oriented focus is where kind of depression situates. So if we can not have a tug of war with the past and the future, we can situate where we are now and where we are now is already happening. So we don't need to worry about it because it's here. And then the last part is just doing what matters. So is what we do aligned to what we really want to stand by in our life? You know, what's important to us? What are the values that underpin our performance? When we talk about high performance, it's really connecting with those, those inner values of what do I want my life to stand for? They sound like existential questions, but it, you know, if we can connect everything we do to that, it gives us a, a higher sense of purpose and being, and it can drive performance. It can drive recovery and motivation around rehabilitation. Um, but it can also just help us navigate everyday life. So I don't even know if that answers your question or, or but I just think it's an important context for I guess the work that I do and it helps to simplify it for me in the work that I do with individuals in what the process is when they speak with a psychologist, cause everyone's different. But if we can focus on those three things of just opening up to that experience, being present in it and doing what matters, we can find that way of being flexible and that can be helpful really helpful. Yeah, that definitely, definitely answered the question. One interesting thing that I learned the term for recently, as I was actually learning some stuff about nutrition coaching, because it comes up a lot in nutrition coaching and behavior change is the term emotional granularity. And I can't remember what the, um, medical term is, but there's actually a medical term for somebody who can't express like a range of emotions. I can't remember what it is, but is that something that you find a lot of people deal with that you work with? Yeah, there, there is. And, and that emotional granularity or that is kind of that verbal representation of emotions and, and experiences. And there is that. And what I encourage people to do is understand emotions, not from their own point of view, but we can all see and, and 
understand how people express emotions, but often at times, if I ask someone, what, what emotion are you feeling right now? It might take a little while to get to that, the crux of those emotions, because they're not at the surface level, they're, they're somewhere deeper down. That's because we haven't given ourselves the, the time and space to really touch base with what we're feeling and experiencing. And we often don't, um, label or associate our day-to-day -day life with any of those emotions. We just kind of navigate them. And if they're uncomfortable or negative, we push them away or we distract ourselves from them. So I would just encourage us to increase our vocabulary around emotions and the emotions that we experience. And in doing that, we can improve our, I guess, our emotional agility, our ability to recognize, make room for those emotions, hold space for them, not judge them, just accept them. And, and in doing that, we know that, or we find that emotions are, are okay. We can navigate the world just fine with them. We don't need to push them away. And it's just really that emotional agility is our ability to navigate emotions effectively and skillfully. So bringing all this together now into sport, this is an interesting thing that I've been thinking about a lot recently and talking to a good amount of people about is that exercise or sport is a healthy tool in your overall mental health toolbox, right? If you, you can't expect somebody to have nothing and feel mentally healthy, but there is a time when it becomes an over-reliance. And if this was taken away due to injury, you, you know, might be in a bad place. So the interesting thing for me has been, where is that line? And maybe it's different for each person, but I'd be interested to hear your take on how to understand, Hey, is this a healthy tool in my toolbox or do I have an unhealthy reliance on this for my mental health? Yeah. And it's, it's hard to know where that line is because it, every individual is different. And what I find is it's both sides of it. And I, I want to touch on the kind of overuse side, because from a psychological point of view, I, I work with a lot of dancers. Um, and runners, and there's a lot of kind of overuse injuries that come out of that. And the over-reliance on wanting to perform is a complex one. It's not just a personal, uh, viewpoint to want to push ourselves. It could be culturally, it could be the fact that we need it to survive for an income. It could be many, many factors at play here that influence that overuse or overtraining or overcommitment to, to sport. Um, which can lead to injury, uh, or illness, um, or other challenges, mental health, uh, challenges. So there is a, there is a fine line, but I think we just got to ask ourselves, how is this help helpful to me? What, whatever this activity, the sport, this, uh, thing is that I'm engaged in and I'm, I'm doing, is it, is it helpful? Is it, is there any kind of drawbacks to it? Is there anything that's causing harm or challenging me if we can understand that then maybe we can find where that line is but i would encourage everyone to maybe look at that individually and yeah it's it it is complex the the interplay there but what we also got to think of is a what maybe a more broader picture is where do we situate our identity within those things because if we're and going back to me as a, a rugby player my identity was very much fixed in that I identified as a rugby player and, and not much else at that time. And that made being injured and getting injured and eventually retiring far more difficult to transition from and manage and deal with because I lost a set, I lost, I lost a bit of myself and I didn't know what I was if I didn't do that activity. And that is the case for a lot of people and a lot of professional athletes, um, that I work with as well. And there is programs in play now that enable them to transition out of their sport when they're close to their retirement and focus on their other identities. And we see a lot of athletes doing that, going into business or studying or doing something that takes them, gives them an opportunity to, you know, add to their identity at that time, because that transition can be hard. But when we're faced with an injury, it's a forced stop. And if our identity is fixed in that, it can become unhealthy and it becomes a uh, reliance on that to, for our self-esteem, for our purpose, for our belonging, uh, for our connectedness. 
And then we might, when faced with an injury, you know, deny that we're injured or we'll try and continue training or playing or performing whilst injured because we we're in denial and we can't accept that that's no longer what we can do for that moment, if that makes sense. So there's a lot of complex complexity to it, but I would maybe to draw that line, to find that line, to find that balance for each and in every individual, I would encourage them to think of their identities and who they are and how much of their identity is situated into that one thing. You know, the kind of eggs in the basket um, analogy, if you like, and just encourage to maybe think of all the other identities as well, or challenge to grow other identities to, to balance that. So some people, and I used to be this way, may see life as very black and white, like this is my identity and I can have one identity and that's it. So could you speak to that ability to gather identity from multiple different parts of your life? Yeah. So I look at identity as the kind of the legs on a table, right? There's, there's multiple legs that, that construct a table that hold a table up that create that balance on that table. And when one of them go, it creates a, quite a big imbalance depending on how many legs your table has. So more legs you have on your table, the more likely is that if one of them was to go, then it's not going to disrupt or create that imbalance which can be really uncomfortable emotionally and psychologically to deal with. So I would encourage people to look at their identity as a way of uh, forward coping in case there was a uh, disruption or change, but we all have multiple identities. Firstly, we can look at it as from a human being perspective or an athlete perspective or a partner perspective or a friend or a colleague or the job that you do. So there are multiple person, multiple uh, identities at play there. And I would just encourage people to expand on that, you know, expand on who they are. And we all construct a narrative or a story about who we are, and it can be fixed in one place. I, I am Carl and I'm a psychologist. And oftentimes I find myself, I catch myself saying that and introducing myself as that, but I am, I am more than that because if I was to lose that or wasn't a psychologist anymore, I would find it really hard to identify who I am if I didn't already think about those other identities at play. So having those multiple identities help, up, help us cope if we were to lose our job, if we were to lose our sport, if we were to deal with a setback or challenge within that, because our identity is largely linked to our esteem, how we view ourselves and our self-esteem. And if one of those areas is going badly, but it's what we strongly identify with, then it's going to have a knock on effect on our self-esteem and probably our confidence. So if we can spread that out a bit, then we're likely not to be as contingent on that one thing. So it's our self-esteem is going to be more stable, our identity is more stable, so less likely to be disrupted or in, unbalanced. If, does that make sense? Yeah. So for somebody who say you work with a lot of runners, right? That takes a lot of time, especially as you train for the longer races. That's a large part of your life. And for a lot of people that maybe have very busy lives, this is the one thing they can control. And so it can be easy to be very intoxicating to, you know, oh, I can control this. I'm doing well at this. You know, I'm hitting PRs. I'm qualifying for, you know, marathons or something like that. And so then it's, I feel like it's a, very easy cycle to go into to just keep inflating this because this is the one thing that you can control and you keep getting that in um, dopamine hit right of achievement and achievement and achievement and then it just balloons and then all of a sudden this is all you talk about all you think about and it feels good but then as you said when you get injured where does that go yeah absolutely and what i find in a lot of in injured athletes that have that a really strong identity in their sport and uh, especially for runners, like you say, um, they're ingrained in, in that and transfixed in it. And it's, they're receiving a lot of positive feedback from it, whether that's chasing PBs or, um, 
certain timings, they're getting that reinforcement and that acknowledgement that gives them a good feeling along with all those endorphins that are kicking at the same time. So when that goes, there's this huge disruption and there's existential questions of who I am, what I'm stand for. And what I find is a lot of people then put all, take all their eggs out of that basket that's, that's kind of fallen on the floor and, and they just go and chuck all their eggs into that next basket that they can see in front of them. And for some that's work for, for others, it might be something else. And that's not the most helpful strategy either, because then they become all consumed in that other thing. And I, ha I have a client that I worked with for a very long time who was exactly that was, was identified really, really strongly with, with her sport and it gone away. So she put all of that emphasis into work and work was also a big stressor for her in her life and all consuming. And it just contributed to the stresses that she was experiencing at that time. So it was really challenging, but she did that because she held on to that identity so strongly and it was gone and that disruption and that disruption to the sense of who she was, was difficult to, too challenging to comprehend. So she found a new thing to focus in, in on, but that created an unhealthy relationship with work. Um, because she treated work in the same way as she was treating her running and it just created this real imbalance there as well. So it is tough. It's really challenging to, to think about, cause I guess athletes uh, might not think about this until it happens uh, to them. And then at that point, we don't really have the, the, the anything in place to deal with it. So if we can now just encourage people to think about those different identities that they hold and you know, how much each of those identities is, is taking in terms of their time and their commitment and their energy. And then we're kind of spreading that risk, you know, it's like a roulette table. We're just kind of spreading our, our risk there and hoping to get land on some returns along the way. So I keep saying runners just because training for a long race takes a long time, but you could also say in the gym as well, if somebody's like, I want to get in front of this and not put myself at risk for this, but I don't want to take away what I'm already doing because it brings me a lot of value, but I don't feel like I have time for another identity with work and my training or whatever. I don't even know where I would fit something else in to bring a different leg right to my identity table. Mm -hmm. So if somebody came to you with that concern, what would you say to them? I would encourage individuals to find a deeper purpose and by deeper purpose, I mean, try to, uh, remember that you're not defined solely by your athletic prowess or abilities, your identity as an athlete or a performer often goes beyond that. And it becomes an intrinsic part of you influencing your lifestyle, your friendships, uh, your, even your self-esteem. So really understanding that if that was to go, where do you focus in on? So redefining yourself beyond sports and knowing that you are more than what you do. You know, your, your athletic sense of identity is part of who you are, but you are more than that. But I find that people are adopting those identities without maybe consciously being aware of it. So then they might, when they get injured, then adopt that identity as an injured athlete or uh, an athlete that's rehabbing. And that becomes their identity then for a long time, because it's a narrative that supports their journey. And it's how they describe themselves to others, especially if it's a serious injury. I work with a lot of ACL injured athletes and rehab journey is, is long. So that becomes their identity and you see it on social media, you know, a lot of accounts being created are solely around what it is that they're now engaged in, which becomes almost that full-time job, that full-time commitment. So. We lose that identity. It creates a crisis of identity, leaving us feeling lost and uncertain. So just what I do with people is not encourage them to add another leg to their, their, their table to create stability, but just find a deeper purpose beyond everything that they're doing. And what I'll do is try and connect their values, um, from their sport 
So what do they really value in that sport? What was the reason that they were doing it? And if we can pull and extract those values out, then we can find everyday life things that we can live by those values doing. And by that, that creates a, still that sense of purpose and belonging and fulfillment, um, without really having to redirect our energies to creating a new identity or a new sense of self, if that makes sense. So just connecting with that purpose, that those values and just redefining ourselves beyond sport, knowing that we are more than what we do. We are more than our sport. We're more than our injury. You know, we are more than that, those experiences combined. So this is a big question and I don't want to take up too much of your time. So feel free to give a uh, kind of shortened answer if you want, but pain science is a very deep rabbit hole when it comes to your injury rehab and it's, you know, how you feel about the injury, what you expect to feel next time you, you know, lift or run. Do you find that on top of the identity work, you're often dealing with a lot of that as well with your clients as they're rehabbing, kind of learning to trust their body again, that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of the biggest areas that I, I see and I face, especially in that return phase is dealing with that kind of fear avoidance cycle and, and that pain experience comes into it. And often when we're faced with that pain experience, there is potential that we misinterpret that pain and when we misinterpret it, we then might start thinking about the pain and it's really challenging because the injury is conscious it's there, we feel it. And when we feel it, that pain, it brings our attention to it. And that attention then creates these thoughts that those thoughts can be start to spiral and we can start catastrophizing around that pain. And when we do that, it's this idea that this pain will ruin everything and will never end. I'll never return back to where I was. I'll never be, get rid of this nag nagging feeling that I've got. And then we increase our fear around that. So we experience negative emotions to do with that pain and the, the catastrophizing that's gone on. And that increases the threat of what it is. And then, then it leads to avoidance. So then we stop for some stop rehabbing because it's bringing up those sensations, those feelings which are leading to that, those thoughts and the negative emotions like fear. And it just is a self kind of fulfilling prophecy. And then it just keeps feeding into this pain experience. And that's when for a lot of athletes, they get stuck. They get stuck in that cycle, that fear avoidance kind of cycle to do with pain or to do with the fear of re-injury. So yeah, it is, it is a big challenge. And I think that's where we have to come together as a kind of MDT to really understand both the physical side and, and the psychological side. Cause I see for a lot of athletes, they get that reassurance from their medical team, from their physios, from their SNC coaches, from their physical therapists to, to know that things are okay and to reset those expectations that maybe this isn't or redefine what that new normal is for them in terms of the pains that the aches, the cracks that they, that they experience now. Um, and in doing that, we can lessen the threat, lessen the threat of that experience. If we lessen the threat, we're shifting the focus away from it. And over time we can start to calm those alarm bells that our brain have now developed and our brains are very clever and intuitive. They're setting off those alarm bells to protect us, to reduce our risk of doing what we did before to injure ourselves. So it's a tough one. It's probably one of the, the biggest areas that, that I do find myself working in a lot, whether that's dealing with pain or dealing with re-injury. So we've got to lessen the threat and build up that confidence in knowing that their body can withstand the activity that they're trying to integrate back into. Yeah. It's so interesting because I've researched a lot on pain science and dealt with a lot of athletes that come to me, maybe injured. And, you know, pain doesn't always equal injury, you know, pain can mean a myriad of things. And then, you know, understanding that you get used to the pain. And so then when you're not injured, you expect that pain again. So I, I've known that, but I just came off of a hip injury myself. And so even knowing that it was so interesting, I hadn't dealt with a chronic injury in a while. So, so interesting to go out on a run and the first few steps I, I was like, oh my goodness, I'm expecting to feel this pain still. 
And like, I know all the science behind it, but emotionally, I still am worried about this. Yeah. And then that worry around the, the pain creates more focus on, on it. And then we're, we're kind of worrying about the worry and it's like a secondary emotion based on that initial emotion that we're feeling. So it can be really challenging, but the fact that you went out and you, you engaged in a behavior would tell me that your, your thoughts and emotions have not influenced your behavior to, to lead to avoidance. So in, in actually engaging that, in that activity, you've helped lessen the threat, even if those emotions and, and feelings that you felt were uncomfortable, you're helping your brain to know that it's safe to do that. And it's the same as when we're dealing with phobias or any kind of fear or threat that we're faced, the more we're subjected to it the, and, um, the less negative consequences we experience from it, the more our brain is just going to calm it down and, and know that it's no longer threatening to us. So it's the same with reintroduction and for your experience, it, I guess it's just doing that. And the more regular you're able to, to step into that, make room for those feelings uh, and emotions and know that they're completely normal at this stage after facing a chronic condition, then hopefully over time, that gives you a, an ability to do that thing. If you can connect it to your values and what's important about going out for that run, then you can still make, you can do that activity, but make room for those feelings to still be there and just accept them that it's. They it might be there for a while, but it's completely normal part of the process and we can make room for them and not let them get in the way of what it is that we really value, the things that we really want to do in our life. So if somebody is dealing with an injury or they feel maybe disconnected about their, you know, values and their goals, or maybe they feel like they have an over-reliance on their sport or just exercise in general, and they're interested in, you know, working with somebody on this. Could you maybe explain how you work people up when you work with them and the different ways people can get in touch with you? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I work largely you know, on a one-to-one -one basis um, with individuals and much in, the, in, in what we talked about today, I work from uh, an acceptance and commitment therapy basis. Um, so what we're trying to do is just increase our psychological flexibility during the, some of the challenges that we're faced, whether that's the emotional challenges of the onset of injury, navigating rehab or that return to faith, return to sport phase and, and increasing our confidence in our body's ability to, to engage in activity again. So a large part of my work is uh, online through, through one-to-one -one support. So I'll, I'll sit down and, and we'll go through and work through some strategies, some ways of dealing with some of these challenges and a, a large part of my clients are ones that I've engaged with throughout the recovery process, some from start to finish, some halfway through. So if anyone is struggling with the emotional side or the psychological side or any challenges along the way, I would, yeah, encourage them to speak to not just myself, but any other psychologist in, in this area to get the support that they need emotionally and psychologically. I also work with physios to try and support them. I partner with a lot to, to add to their I guess, package of support that they offer to their clients just from an emotional and psychological point of view. Because sometimes for a lot of physios, they're, they're faced with that. They're having to manage and navigate that for their clients, which can be a, a toll for, for individuals as well. So I would encourage any physios to, to think about their support in that way and maybe look at partnering with psychologists or you know, having that MDT approach or that biopsychosocial approach to, to the care that they, they offer. Um, but yeah, I mean, if individuals want to get in touch with me, I have my website at theinjurypsychologist.com or they can reach out to me on Instagram at the injury psychologist, happy to, to support, refer, or, or just have a conversation about some of those challenges. So yeah, hit me up if, if you're in that space and, and need some support. Awesome. Well, it was great to talk to you. I feel like we could have talked for hours on this because it's such a deep topic. It's so interesting. But yeah, it was great to talk to you. Thank you for coming on. And I'm sure people will get a lot of value from this. I know I did. Amazing. Thanks, Justin. Thanks for having me. Yeah, have a great rest of your day.
Yeah. Cheers, mate. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. If you enjoyed it, it would be helpful if you could leave a rating or review on whatever platform you're listening on, as that helps us reach more audiences and get more awesome guests on. If you're interested in anything we talked about today, you can check the show notes for all links. Otherwise, I will see you guys in the next podcast.